Um, so I, I'll speak about recent developments of the Lural problem. Uh, this is something which started uh, essentially in December uh, 2013 with a paper of Claire Voisin, but you'll, you'll see uh, um, you'll see later. Okay, so I'll start with reminding you of the questions of rationality, stable rationality, unirationality, and rational connectedness for various for algebraic varieties. So we look at an irreducible reduced variety over the complex. If you want, you can think of it as just uh, one polynomial in n variables and solution of f equals zero and the polynomial is irreducible. And then you ask, uh, is x birational to projective space? So what does that mean? That means that your variety, which looks very complicated, in fact, it contains an open set, which is isomorphic, without exceptions, to an open set and projective space. So this is the notion of rationality. Um, to explain it, the simplest thing is to explain something which you'll we'll see on the next slide is that you've all learned at school is that if you take a circle, well, it looks like a complicated equation, but uh, if you pick a point here and you take a line here, P1, and then you make this, you let this line move like this, you get a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence between the points of the circle and the points of the line. So the circle is a rational variety. Uh, there's a notion which is a bit more abstract, which looks a bit more strange, but which is the notion of being stably rational. So instead of having x birational to pn, you ask that after multiply by, by some projective space, the variety becomes rational. So if you like uh, fields, if you like abstract algebra rather than, than geometry, uh, rationality, and say so we're over C, means that the function field of the variety, which is basically you take yeah. the polynomials divide by the equation f and take the function field, you ask whether it's rationality, the question whether this extension, the function field, is purely transcendental. So whether it can be spanned by just one, one equation. So like, uh, I mean, here if I look, uh, I can take C of x plus i, y, that will do it. Okay, that will be purely transcendental uh, of, of this. And uh, stable rationality and you, ask, you allow extra variables. So you allow variables, so what did I put here? Uh, Pn, so T1, Tn, algebraically independent. And you ask whether you can produce some extra variables so that this extension is purely transcendental. And the question whether these two conditions are equivalent uh, was raised by Zariski in 1940, uh, 50, 50, 49, I think. Okay. Then there's a notion, of course, if something is rational, then it is stably rational. Okay. Then there's notion of being unirational. So unirational, in, t in these terms, unirational is asking whether you can switch your function field between C and some purely transcendental extension of C. For instance, you cannot do that with the function field of an elliptic curve. Okay. Okay, so in geometric terms, you want the dominant rational map from projective space to X. In fact, you, it's easy to show that if some big projective space dominates your variety of dimension R, then PR dominates the variety of dimension R. And then there's a notion which is which is developing more recently, which has been developed more recently, which is this notion of rational connectedness. So rational connectedness was developed basically around 1990. And so it's uh, you ask that any two points, so if you take any two points A and B, you can connect on, on your variety of the complex, you connect can them by a curve of genus zero. Going from A and B. Right? So there are, there are different notions, and each imply the next one. And then, as usual, you ask, what about the converse? Okay. So if something is rationally connected, is it irrational? If something is irrational, is it stably rational? If something is stably rational, is it rational? 
So, I'm, I, so this was just to, ex to give some examples. So I told you about uh, conic, but you actually the same argument which I explained there works for an arbitrary non-singular qu quadric. So if you take an equation sum x i square equals zero in projective space, so it's zero. This also is rational by exactly the same argument. The difference between the higher dimensional case and the one dimensional case is that in the one dimensional case, you get an actual one to one isomorphism between your, your smooth uh, conic and P1, whereas in a higher dimension, you just have some open set isomorphic to an open set in projective space. Okay. Uh, a case which is classical, which is not obvious, is the case of a non singular cubic surface. So, I mean, for people who were not there uh, two hours ago, so it is a classical argument that, you, uh, well, Sylvester proved, studied the lines on a cubic, smooth cubic surface and proved that there are 27 lines and studied the configuration. And so for cubic surfaces, you can find two distinct lines, L1 and L2, lying inside your cubic surface. And so what you do is that you take P2, uh, so you're in projective space P3, and then you do, a, uh, so you st if you start from a, uh, the fact is that in P3, if you have two lines which do not meet, and if you take a general point A, then you c the plane spanned by A L N1, and L1 is, is a P2, and then you have the plane spanned by A and L2, to so another P2, the intersection is the line, so it is a unique line, in fact, which goes through A and meets these two, two lines. And so you do that, so you, you, uh, you start with a point on your cubic surface, you take the unique line which uh, meets these uh, two lines, and it's going to hit to a point called F of A. And conversely, and this is where the cubic, so that you could do, uh, well, in many cases, but for a cubic surface, what happens is if you go back, if you start from a point P here, and you do draw this unique line that goes through these two things, this unique line is going to meet the cubic surface in one point, a second point, and then a well-defined third point, unique third point. And so this would be the, the F minus one of B field. So that's a Barashall correspondence. So cubic surfaces have this property. And then uh, if you take a cubic hypersurface, so a cubic form in a big number of variables, a non-singular, uh, a fact is that they are unirational. And this is a, also a nice geometric construction. So you take your cubic hypersurface in projective space P and C. Then you choose, a, you, you pick a line. So you, because cubic surfaces contain a line, certainly a cubic hypersurface will also contain a line. And then uh, what you do is you, you um, so what, what do you do with this? Um, you take uh, the pairs containing of uh, a point P and a line L tangent. So you take a point P in L and then the line L tangent to x to the cubic surface uh, at this point P. Okay, and then if you project that down to L, what you get is, uh, uh, if you think a bit, and I, I won't go into details, but this is a, this is the basic thing, you find that here you get a, a fiber, a projective bundle, and here you get a two to one map to your cubic uh, to surface. So to cubic hypersurface. So it's, there's a two to one map from something which is birational to projective space to the cubic hypersurface. Okay, so I, I won't say too much about this because I, I won't have time. Okay, and then if you take X in PN, a non-singular hypersurface of degree D, what happens is that if the, if the number of variables is much bigger than the degree, then people proved um, in the 30s maybe earlier, no, I think it's 30s, uh, Prezanson proved that these varieties are unirational. Okay. But for, well, okay, and then for n at least d, they're at least rationally connected. So these are examples of these four properties I was discussing before. Or well, three properties at least. Okay, so now for curves, uh, it's a theorem of Lurot in uh, 1890, something like that that uh, if a curve is dominated by, by, a, by a P1, it must be a P1. And basically it's because uh, if, you, uh, if you like um, normal language, 
uh, if you have a curve which is dominated by a P1, if your curve was of genus at least one, it would have a holomorphic, non-trivial holomorphic differential, which will pull back to P1. But there are no such things on P1. So the, the curve downstairs has to be of genus zero. That's one of the many ways to, to prove it. And then for surfaces, it is also true that unirational implies rational with a complex field. And this was proved by Casanovo, and it's really one of the, the, the high points of uh, Italian algebraic geometry. Okay. In spite of uh, what uh, I think Casanovo says at the beginning of his book, that se le curve sono l'invenzione del dio, le superfici sono l'invenzione del diavolo. So if the curves are the invention of the devil, the surfaces are the invention, oh, sorry, if the curves are the invention of God, the surfaces are the invention of, of the devil. But never, nevertheless, uh, unirational surfaces are rational. So, the, but the situation changes as soon as the dimension of x is at least three. So, examples with x smooth and projective, unirational and not rational, were given uh, in 72, 74. So, there, there were three examples. So, it, in case you are not in this field, uh, let me remind you, this is quite striking because the problem had been going on for a long time. Fano had claimed to have a proof, and there was a gap in the proof. And then, Ser proved, in fact, that the pi one, uh, topological pi one, of a, of, a, of a unirational variety has to be trivial, whereas this is the invariant which Fano was trying to use. So, so Clements and Griffiths proved that a smooth cubic hypersurface in P4, which is unirational, as I said, is never rational. Okay? So it is unirational, but it's never rational. And the tool they use is something called intermediate Jacobian of, uh, of, 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 of such varieties. It's a quite elaborate uh, method where you look at the dimension of a single locus of a certain theta D divisor. And it works, so it, one thing, it works in dimension three. I don't know of extensions in higher dimension. And uh, it doesn't say whether X is not stable rational. So it shows that X is not birational to P3, but it could be that X cross P1 is birational to P4. The second method was the method by Iskowski and Manin. So they proved that if you take any smooth quartic hypersurface in P4, so given by extension equation, equation of degree 4, um, and some of them are rational, are unirational, you know, they proved that the group of birational automorphisms, so the, this, the ones which we might have exceptions, in fact, they have no exceptions. So any birational automorphism is an automorphism. And then, in fact, this group of automorphism of a smooth quartic surface is a finite group. And so that's a big difference with the case of projective space, because projective space, you have all these inversions, Cremona group, which is enormous. So that implied that X was not rational. But again, this method doesn't disprove stable rationality. And then there was the artin muffet example, which looked rather special, but which we'll see has uh, gained a new life in the last two years. Um, so it's, it's a very specific uh, double cover of P3. Uh, this, there's a pointer, no? No. Oh, there is. Oh, this thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's a double cover of P3. So it's, it's three, three variables. Uh, ramified on a certain singular quartic. So the quartic is very special, it's got uh, 10 singular points. And you can also view it as a conic bundle over P2. So we want to choose it's unirational. And then the invariant which one uses is, um, is uh, for a smooth projective model of this, is the, the torsion in the third Betty cohomology group of X, which they actually compute. So they compute the desingularization and they compute the torsion in here. And people who are more, less on the topology side, more on the algebraic groups, uh, on the algebraic side, they think of this as the Brouwer group of the variety. And now that invariant has one advantage over the previous ones, is that it can tell you that the thing is not stably rational. Okay. So we had three methods, very completely different, different methods. And uh, only the last one tells you that something is not stably rational. Uh, perhaps, uh, sorry, since I'm not going to talk about this, I should say, once I can come back. Uh, so, uh, these two, rational and stable rational, do not coincide. And so this is something uh, um, 
Bouville, uh, Sansuk, uh, Sunna and I proved long ago, we produced some example, and it's still at this time the only example known of a, a three-dimensional variety which is stable rational, which is not rational. And that the invariant is the Clemens Griffiths invariant for the non-rationality. Okay, so uh, in uh, uh, 1988, uh, Ayungaran and I, we looked at the Dartin method and we wanted to generalize it to see whether there was an invariant that the Brouwer groups could, could do the same service. Okay, and so we define, well, one defines uh, higher unrefined cohomology groups, which for I equals one uh, classify simply finite unrefined coverings of a smooth projective variety. So in, for unirational, you get zero, for instance, by the same result. For I equals two, this is exactly the Alton Manfred invariant, but then you have other I's. And so we produce example of chronic bundles of a P3, for which the non rationality was detected by this new invariant, but none of the previous methods. Uh, but so this is uh, something of dimension six which we produce. But if we are interested in rash and it's rationally connected, but it's of dimension six. So you can ask what, ask what happens in lower dimension. And in fact, there's a theorem of Voisin which shows that for rationally connected threefolds, this group actually is zero. So here, for rationally connected threefolds, to tell whether something is not stable or rational is getting harder. Okay. Now, something. Uh, happened in so 20, 20 years later, after this uh, series of three papers, the Collar uh, had a very nice uh, method to prove that, in fact, many hypersurfaces of degree d smaller than n, roughly if d is big enough, uh, roughly bigger than 2n over 3, if they are sufficiently general, so it's not like the Clemens Griffiths where no thing or the, the Maniskovsky, so if they are sufficiently general, then it's not rational. In fact, Collar proves that X is not even birational to some variety cross P1. And so, with th because this property of being birational to X cross P1 is something which specializes in families. So, for instance, if you take a, a family of cubic surface, it can degenerate to something which, so cubic surfaces are rational, it can degenerate to something which is not rational, like uh, X cubed plus Y cubed plus Z cubed plus lambda T cubed equals zero. So if you specialize to lambda equals zero, you get something which is not rational because you get something which is birational to P1 cross an empty curve. But still, there's a P1. Okay? And this is a general phenomena uh, proved by, by Matsuzaka that uh, things specialize. In fact, Kola specializes to characteristic P, so it is brave, and they use differentials over the characteristic P field to, to prove his, his result. Okay, so, yeah, so I wanted to, so I, I, in fact, I prepared this. So stable rational is different from rational. This is what I, I wanted to say. Yeah. Using, for the non-rationality, we use the, the Clemens Griffiths method, as improved by Bouville. For unirational, different from stable rational, as I said, we have the Brouwer group, the Artin Manfred invariant, or the invariant, the IR and Raphael cohomology. And then this big open problem, but I have nothing to say about this, and nobody has anything to say about this, is whether rationally connected is the same as unirational. Are there any candidates uh, that should be uh, are suspected to be rationally connected but not unirational? Yeah, Bo uh, Bouville always mentioned an example, but I've forgotten what it is. So it's uh, it's something of degree four of or degree five, a hypersurface of degree four or degree five in projective space with a, sp with a certain double line on it. But I well, I can search for you the the one the candidate which Bouville okay. produces. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but for instance, conic bundles are a P two. Uh, they're, they're automatically, they're obviously rationally connected because if you take a conic bundle of a P2, you take in it, you see, if you take a conic bundle of a P2, so a family of, of conics fibered or, or a P2, if you take any two points, well, uh, well you, can, uh, you can project them to points here. So you have A and B, so it projects to so C and D. Then there's a line in P2 going through C and D. And then when you have a conic bundle of a line, it has a section. This is just 10 theorem. So you find a section here, which is a line. And then you go A goes to A dash, goes to uh, B dash, goes to B. And so you're connected by a chain of curves of genus zero. And then because of properties of rationally connected varieties, in fact, A and B are connected by just one curve of genus zero. So any conic bundle is, uh, is rationally connected over P2, but nobody believes that they're irrational. So these are, okay. the, uh, yeah, people don't believe they're irrational. Okay. 
It's, I mean, people like Iskowski have been thinking about this problem many, you know, for many years. It's, very, it's a very big open problem. But nobody believes they're irrational. OK, so uh, let's look at smooth cubic hypersurfaces. So as I said, all are unirational. The bark bar, uh, the, the Artin muffin invariant is zero. So here we have nothing to say. For n equals four, they're never rational. So I repeat, we have no idea whether some of them are stably rational, whether all of them are stably rational. This is entirely open. For n equals five, some are rational. And then we do not know whether this is an exception. And for n arbitrary, again, we have no idea whether they're all stably rational or not. So it's just to tell you how ignorant we are. OK, now uh, let's look at the, the, the Iskowski mining thing. So these were smooth quartic hypersurfaces. Again, some are unirational, possibly all, we don't know. And so, but they're never rational. But the Artin method invariant is zero. And then there was a question whether it's stable rational. So in this lecture, uh, at the end, we'll see that we know how to answer this question in general. So this is a new development which occurred in the beginning of 2014. So I have to explain the kind of invariance we, we, we try to use to disprove stable rationality. So take a field now, an arbitrary field, and there's some good reason to take an arbitrary field. Even if you're interested in varieties of a C, there's some good reason to look at, take your variety of a C and then extend the ground fields to some big field, which is not algebraically closed. Typically a function field of some other variety. Okay, so take, take a field, X of variety, then there's a notion of zero cycle on this variety. So it's a finite linear combination with integral coefficients of closed points of x. So if you're not familiar with closed points, just think that you have a variety of a field which is not algebraically closed. You have the notion of rational points, the solutions of, of the ground field. But you can take uh, a bunch of conjugate extension, uh, solutions in a finite extension. So all of them together, that's a closed point. And the reason it's closed point is called closed point because it's, in terms of commutative algebra, if you have a, an algebra of finite type of a field, that corresponds to maximal ideals. It's a theorem that uh, is just a, well, it's Hilbert. Okay. So that's a closed close point. But it's, it's, it's nicer to think of, clo think of closed points, so maximal ideals, rather than this bunch of conjugate elements, which are a bit of a nuisance. Okay, and then there's a notion of a zero cycle, which is rationally equal to zero, which is defined like this. You take any curve, closed curve, inside x, and then you take a rational function, on this curve, so you have this curve in this big dimensional uh, variety, and take a rational function. You can look at the divisor of the rational function on the curve, so you get a zero cycle on the curve. You decide on x, this is trivial. Okay, this is the definition. So this, you have the quotient. And then with the variety is projective, because the number of poles of a function is equal to the number of is zero on, on, a, on, a smooth, on, a, on a curve. We have a d the degree map, which sends some ni pi to some ni degree of this closed point over the ground field, is mods out by rational equivalence. So you get a degree map to z. If you were an algebraic closed field, it would, simply, it would simply be the sum of the ni. Okay? And so an easy result, but which is quite useful, is that if x is non singular, projective, or reducible, if it is stable rational, then if you take any field extension of your ground field, the degree map is an isomorphism. So apart from the degree, there's nothing. Okay. And then we say that x is universally CH0 trivial if this property holds. Uh, and it's been discussed by Merkouriev uh, and, and uh, also these people. So, uh, and I repeat, even when the ground field is the complex field, it is it worth looking at arbitrary fields containing C. Okay. So now, yeah, there's a warning here, which is important, is that even though it's quite striking that the char group of zero cycles might be universally trivial, this is, does, does not imply that your variety is rational. So there are examples of surfaces of the complex which are universally say, zero trivial, but we, which are of general type. So therefore, they're, they're not at all rational. Okay. So that's, that's not a sufficient, uh, there's no dream that uh, universal triviality of the char group for all varieties would imply stable rationality. So, yeah, it was there a question? Yeah. Um, so, the people who do not like function fields or big fields, they speak in terms of decomposition of the diagonal. So, this property that C0 is universally trivial, you can translate it like this. So, suppose you have a complex field, 
again. So a block and string inverse, I've studied the consequences of C0 omega equals Z, where omega is an arbitrary algebraic closed field containing C. Not an arbitrary field, but an algebraic, algebraic closed field. Okay? And then there's a translation, which is that you look at the diagonal in X cross X, so the set of elements uh, at PP. Uh, so that's a sub-variety of codimension D in this variety of dimension 2D. And then this, this assumption here uh, is equivalent to the fact that there exists some positive integer such that n times the diagonal decomposes as a sum of two things, uh, two devices of uh, up to rational equivalence in the char group of cycles of condemnation D, uh, where Z1 has support in point times x, and Z2 has support in some proper variety cross x. So this is called the rational decomposition of the diagonal. And so what, for instance, Block and Srivers proved is that this assumption here is very strong, or this one, because in fact they're, they're equivalent. First, it implies that all these cohomology groups are zero. But I repeat, this is not enough to imply rationality. So the notion, if, if instead of taking arbitrary algebraic closed field, we take arbitrary field, we get the same thing except that we can take n to be one. That's the difference. So. N is universally C0 trivial if only there exists such a decomposition with n equals 1. So delta is, is equal to Z1 plus Z2 in the char group with the support in X cross X and the support of Z2 in, in Y cross X. So, so the language in this language, we have this property. If X is stably rational, then there's an integral decomposition of the diagonal. It's called an integral decomposition of the diagonal. So what, uh, what Claire Voisin did in December 2013 she had this uh, great idea. So you start with a projective family of varieties over a curve gamma. So the one parameter family of varieties. Okay. Everything over C. And you assume that the general fiber has dimension at least two. Okay, that's, uh, not to talk nonsense. And is non-singular. And, the, and then you assume that the special fiber at some point S is singular, but it's not too singular. It has ordinary quadratic singularities. that just look like you know, the cone of our quadratic. Okay, and then you call Z goes to X a resolution of singularities, which is very simple. That is, you blow up each singular point, and on top of this, you get a smooth quadrature. And then the specialization theorem which we've proved is the following. If there's no integral decomposition of the diagonal for Z, for this particular one, then there is no integral decomposition of the diagonal for XT, for T in gamma, very general. And in particular, XT is not semi rational. So from a property of the desingularization of the special fiber, you get the property that for the general, very general one, uh, there is no, uh, the very general one is not stably rational. Okay? So it could happen that on the Z, the invariants that told you that the thing is not stably rational, for instance, the bar group, they all vanish on the, on the, on the smooth fibers. See? You use the, the, the invariant on the designation of the special fiber, an invariant which would tell you nothing on the, on, the, on, the, on the general fiber. But you have this, this property which has to do with the, this, the char group property. Okay. So to explain one thing is the notion of very general and complex geometry is something which uh, if you're much an algebraist you don't like very much. It says that uh, the property holds outside, so you have a, some varieties like say all hypersurfaces of degree D in Pn, they're parameterized by some projective space. And very general means that in the projective space parameterizing your hypersurfaces, you have countably many proper hypersurfaces, which might be bad. But then if you're outside of this, and there are some points over C, you're happy. But for instance, if you're over Q bar, you're in trouble because all the Q bar points could lie on this countably many union of varieties. Okay. So it's not a very, I mean, I, well, okay, it is what it is, but it's got, it's got some defect. But anyway, this, is, uh, this was quite striking. So I don't want to go into the proof, except that, no, I don't want to go into the proof. So I, I give you the application which she had, which she looked at double covers of P3 ramified on a, a quartic surface. Now remember that uh, the artin Mumford example was a double cover of P3 ramified on a singular quartic surface. And then I went to the singularization to compute the invariant. Okay. So she does, something even more general, but for this colloquium, let's stick to this. 
she takes a ramified on a smooth quartic surface, okay, and then she lets it degenerate to the artin mumford counterexample. And her result implies that if S is very general, so if this, if this quartic surface is very general, then X, this double cover, is not stable rational. Okay, that's the result by the degeneration argument. But in fact, it is unirational and it satisfies that barb of x is zero and it also satisfies that the h of phi is zero. So all these invariants tell you nothing, but this, this, uh, this special argument to something singular which you resolve and which you resolve nicely tells you that the generic one was not stably rational. So it's quite, uh, it's very nice, very uh, simple to state. Uh, Okay, I repeat, very general means outside a countable union of propulsive rights of particular space parameterizing the quartic surfaces, in this case. So, so I, I told you where the method is, so she specializes to this uh, uh, artin method thing, which is, has 10 ordinary quadratic singularities. Okay, so I repeat the fact that the bar of Z, or the H3 Z, with integral coefficient torsion is non-zero, implies that there does not exist a single, uh, an integral position of the diagonal for this z. So, uh, so we looked, so Anya Pirutka and I, we looked at Poisson's method, and then we developed a, a simple and more general version of uh, a specialization method which was, uh, well, which was quite lengthy. I mean, it could be quite a few pages. So we did something uh, very more in the, in the old uh, French Orsay algebraic geometric style. That is, you don't look at variety of a C, you look at the discrete version ring. Okay, so you localize. You're, instead of looking at your curve, just look at the point and the local ring at the, at the curve, at the point of the curve. So we start with a discrete, okay? start with a discrete version ring. I mean, you can think of, uh, you can think of, of course, you can think of C double bracket T, but you could also think of ZP. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the K is the field of fraction, little k is the residue field, and let's assume here that the residue field is algebraically closed, like this one. And then you take a flat projective family over A. And then make two assumptions. The generic uh, geometric fiber, that is, you go over a capital K and you go over to algebraic closure, is non singular and you must say it's zero trivial. Okay, so this is one assumption that the generic fiber has this property of being universally C is zero trivial. But, you know, we over K bar, we, but we look at all the possible fields containing K bar for this property. And then look at the special fiber. Now, it, it is integral. Which is irreducible if you want it reduced. And then you assume that there's a disinclination morphism, Z2Y, but we allow something um, not as strong as what, uh, I mean, not as strong as what Clavoisin had allowed. We just demand that the map from Z2Y is universally C0 trivial, which means, by definition, that if you take any overfill of K, the map from C0 of ZF goes C0 of YF is an isomorphism. So I, if y was a point, this could correspond to the definition of universally C0 trivial, but you can do it in a relative manner, so it goes to y. Okay? And then the conclusion is that under these two assumptions, th this designalization z is universally C0 trivial. So in particular, the barb of z is zero. Okay? So if, if the geometric generic fiber under this assumption two here, which has to be discussed, if the generic generic fiber has a, ch uh, a char group of degree zero, which is universally trivial, then the same holds for the, the desingularization of the special fiber. So it sounds very much like what we had before. Uh, the difference is that, uh, in fact, in, uh, to prove this, you don't have to prove uh, to use uh, the big machinery which, uh, which Clavardin was using, which was using Hilbert schemes. It's just, yeah, just a theorem of Fulton, which is a very basic theorem which about specialization of char groups. So in a situation like this, where you have something which is uh, proper and flat, over a discrete version ring, the map, there is a special map that goes from CH0 of the generic fiber to the CH0 of the special fiber. So basically, you have your zero cycle on the generic fiber, you spread it out to one cycle on the total space, and then you intersect with the special fiber. And of course, something has to be proved is that it mods out by rational icons. It does. Okay. So this is all that's used. 
And also we don't impose any regularity condition at total space, which is something which Clavoisin was imposing. And this is very convenient in practice because when you deform something which is very singular, it's very hard to deform it to something in such a way that the total space is non-singular. Okay. So, uh, so I discussed the hypothesis in the fiber. So, the fi uh, so we have this z goes to y, this is desingularization. This is a singular one. And then we have these various points M. So again, we're going to think in terms of schematic points. So that look at the generic point of all the possible sub-varieties in Y. And we look at, so there's a real field, kappa of M. And I look at the fiber Z, Z M over kappa of M. So what I'm seeing in this, in this line here is that to check, the, to check this previous property, so we're going to check this property here that uh, the map z to y is unit stage stage zero trivial. Uh, it's enough to check this fiber-wise. So for if for each uh, generic point of closed sub-variety, this map here is unit stage stage zero trivial. So this is just over a field, but this time, even if your field K originally was C, that field will not be algebraically closed because you want to take it not only for the closed points in Y, but you want to take it also for the function field, all the possible sub-varieties in Y. Okay, so that you're forced to consider non-algebraically closed field in this, in this argument. So if, if each of these fiber is unit is zero trivial, then the morphism Z to Y is unit is zero trivial. And you can imagine that this is a quite convenient in practice if you want to, to check this property, just look fiber-wise. Of course, a simple example for inter-species zero trivial morphism is the one which Clavoisin was using when the basis is of dimension at least two and all the singularities are ordinary quadratic singularities. Because in that case, what happens is that in our case, uh, I mean, all the fibers are either, uh, they are either, um, um, I mean, the, the singular ones correspond to the, the they are, um, sorry, when, when you, well, either it's a point, okay. remember this is birational. So the fiber, either the fiber, fiber of a point is a point, or the fiber of a point is, is a quadratic cone over, over the C. Over, uh, it's, a, it's a quadratic cone over C. But uh, uh, down here, in, any two points are connected to, 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 you can go to this point here, so the C is zero is trivial. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So the application we had, and this was uh, from how that pay, uh, it paid off, is that we could handle the Maniniskovsky examples. So Clavoisin was doing was doing uh, double covers of P3 Roman finding on a quartic, and so what we could do we could do quartic hypersurface in P4. Okay, uh, so the claim is that we can find families like this such that the joint fiber uh, is, um, okay, look, first of all, there are examples of quartic hypersurfaces whose single locus is of dimension one and whose desingularization z goes to y has the two properties we want. Okay. And so to do this, again, we start like that with, uh, with the artin mapford surface, which I detailed here. It's quite amusing, it's, it's defined like this. You have um, variables, so this is uh, the surface in P3. You have alpha two of degree two, beta three of degree three, beta gamma four of degree four. And then the relation is that beta squared minus alpha gamma is a product of two elliptic curves. Of, uh, and, uh, and alpha is a conic which is tangent to each of these elliptic curves. So I mean, geometrically, it's quite nice uh, construction. Okay. And so the Artin map for double covered is defined by taking this and taking z four square here. So it's a double cover ramified along this. And so what we do very simply is that we want a quartic surface. Well, we produce a quartic surface. We replace the z4 square by z0 square z4 square. So it looks very trivial. <laughs> now, the difference is that now uh, this thing is more singular than the, than the double cover initially was. So the, the double cover was ramified along, uh, was uh, singular only above these 10 singular points. 
And so you, you could just blow up these 10 singular points and you have something nice. Now here, the single locus of this one is as some curves. So you have to do the blow up. And now it's something which, uh, if you've opened any book on uh, dissingularity singularities, we, you all know now that there are many ways to do dissingularity singularities in characteristic zero, but in fact, they're all very complicated. I mean, if you're given any equation, it's really a nightmare to actually start blowing up, blowing up until in a cl clever way in order to get something non singular. But anyway, I mean, you can, do, in some cases, you can do it and uh, you actually do it. Yeah? And so in that case, we compute the dissingularization and we show that P is universally trivial. And then the fact that the, the invariant is non, is, is non zero for this dissingularization, we don't have to do anything because this thing is birational to the original Martin Mumford thing. And this invariant is a birational invariant. So because Martin Mumford proved that for some desingularization the invariant was non-trivial, for our desingularization also, this invariant is non-trivial. Okay. So the, the work really is in checking that uh, this, this, this desingularization is not too bad. And basically what happens is that over the line, you get some points over which you get some quadrics, that's fine. And then you get some lines, over the lines you get conics. And so uh, because it's got a section by sense theorem, you get something which is universally is zero trivial. So, uh, so it gives uh, so it gives non-singular quartic hypersurfaces in P4, which are not stable rational. And uh, in fact, it immediately produces examples of countable fields. So you see, the, if you speak the language of uh, very general, you're in trouble not only over Q bar, but you're even in trouble over Q of T bar, because Q of T bar is countable. So here, I mean, just, you take your Martin Mumford example of a Q bar, and you can write some of a Q bar. And then you take a P1 <laughs> in the space of parameters that goes through this point, and you take the function field of that P1, and you're done. So over, over Q of T bar, of Q, uh, yeah, over Q of T, one variable, algebraic closure, you get some examples of varieties which are not stable rational. Okay. It's not over Q bar. It's not, well, it's to start with, yeah, yeah, to start with, the thing which is easy to do with this method is that you have your special point of a Q bar. So this is point of a Q, a Q, Q bar, where you have this uh, Y here, which is over Q bar, and this is realization. Then you're in, this is a project of parameters. And then you have the hypersurface of singular uh, quartic hypersurfaces. You take any P1 defined over Q bar, which goes through this. And then you look at the joint point here. So over this field, over Q bar of T bar, you get some quartic, well, actually over Q bar of T, you get a quartic surface, a quartic hypersurface, non-singular, which by this specialization argument is not stable rational and which is defined over Q of Q bar of T. I mean, it's not stable rational even if you go over to the algebraic closure, okay? That's the point, even over, but it is defined over this small field. But in fact, because of the flexibility of, uh, so this is also, I mean, you have to defend yourself. So the, uh, the flexibility of our specialization theorem is that because we don't use this um, argument with Hilbert um, polynomials, uh, we just use something with discrete version rings. Discrete version can be of unequal characteristic. Okay. And so using this, one can actually do a special argument with some ZP, or if you prefer some ZP, Z localized at P. So over FP bar, you, so you start with an Artin Mumford example over FP bar, and you can do it because it's, it's quite obvious. This bar group specializes nicely. So you start with an example over FP bar, and then you lift to ZP, and then you get an example defined over Q or some fine extension of Q. Okay. okay so this is using specialization and unequal characteristic to find fields. Yeah. So I mean, not example, a specific example, but uh, you know it is that there is uh, an example uh, of quartic which is not stable rational and which is defined over Q bar. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And in fact, I think if, we, if you work hard enough, you can produce one over Q. Okay. But uh, I have to think a bit more. Yeah. Yes, yes, by all means. And in fact, not only that, but in fact, there's a risky dance in the space of parameters. Okay. As, uh, Okay, so there was further work. I mean, so, uh, uh, so Bouville used the special argument, basically, I mean, he's an equal characteristic. I mean, he's really a complex algebraic geometry at heart. So, uh, so he showed that double covers of P4, so 
um, so Clavin had done double covers of P3. So he showed the double covers of P4 and of P5, ramified on a very general quartic hypersurface, are not stably rational. And also the double covers of P3, ramified along a very general sextic surface, are not retract rational. So in each case, it's a problem of uh, controlling the desingularization. And so what happens, is why it stops at P4 and P5 is that big, be, if you go beyond that, the desingularization becomes very complicated. So it's, uh, it's hard to see. We haven't mentioned what is retract rational. I haven't mentioned what is retract rational, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So retract rational is, is, is even, yeah, I, I should have, I wanted to erase the word retract rational, but I forgot to erase it. So retract rational means that you take a variety X and you ask that there exists an open set U. There's a map like this. And V is some open set in a fine space AN, a big dimension. This one is of dimension D. This one is of big dimension. So the identity on some open set factorizes through an open set of a rational variety, possibly of bigger dimension. And the idea is that, I mean, people who are in, I mean, more on the homotopy side, they can feel why this, if you have something like this, an invariant that you have here, because it goes through a fine space, it will, it will vanish. Okay. So, uh, it, and this is contractible here. Okay. So, you, I mean, in particular, unified cohomology has to vanish. And, so, and it's very easy to show. I, I, I won't show it here, but it's very beautiful, simple proof, not using any full ton intersection theory, that uh, if you take smooth projective variety, which satisfies this property, then indeed C0 of XF is Z for all, for, for all, for all F containing the ground field. Okay. So this is, uh, and this is of course a, a weaker property a priori than, than stable rational. Something stable rational certainly satisfies this. So, so, and the, if the bar group is non-trivial, then in fact the variety is not, it's not stable rational, but it's not even retract rational. Okay. Okay, so. Yeah, so, but, so, so, um, so this was uh, pushing the method, but, so, but Totaro, in fact, very recently, uh, so this was 2015, uh, uh, he pushed the method even further, and he got really impressive results as far as the results are concerned. And even the, but the idea was very nice. The idea is that, well, here's the result first. He shows that if you take any integer d, and then at least three, for which there is an integer satisfied this condition, it's roughly like the, the Collar condition. It's a bit more precise than the Collar condition. Then a very general hypersurface of degree d in Pn is not retract rational. So Collar proved the result saying that it's not rational, but he proved that it's not retract rational. So it's not stable rational in particular. Okay. And uh, there's uh, one amazing special case is that this includes smooth quartic fourfolds for which non-rationality was not even known. So he proved that at one stroke. And so Kola, uh, Totaro's idea was to mix up this specialization technique with Collar's argument from 20 years ago. And I must say that all the people who have been involved were quite jealous not to <laughs> have found the idea because once you say it, it's clear it's going to work. <laughs> so, okay, so he uses specialized method in an equal characteristic. Okay, as I said, we, we could do and we are done. And then for hypersurface of even degree, he reduces the varieties Y with a simple, so, it, uh, so the specialization, it, it has a, um, it has a simple resolution of singularities, Z goes to Y. And in particular, it, but, but the, the, the Z has the property that there are some global differentials, non-zero. Okay, and this was the invariant which Collard used. This is something you cannot do in characteristic zero. So in characteristic zero, this doesn't matter the work. I mean, you specialize this. But here, what happens is that you specialize to something which is uh, a totally inseparable double cover of some other thing in characteristic two. So it looks a bit awful, but it works extremely well. Okay? And, so, and then he notes that the Z goes to Y because uh, what Collar, what co the work which Collar had done shows that the resolution is very simple. So it is universal uh, CH0 isomorphism. Uh, and then, then he has to use this property combined with the result of GROW about cycle maps 
to show that in fact the z is not universally zero trivial. So this property implies that the z is not universally zero trivial. And then from this follows that the geometric fiber, the geometric generic fiber is not universally zero trivial. Okay? And therefore it's not Sabre rational. So this was uh, quite striking and I think this is the end of the story. Any questions? Yes, kind of. <laughs> Fine, question. So, uh, uh, I know that Tatana recently was uh, quite curious uh, in finding very specific, maybe, uh, surfaces, maybe triples uh, in characteristic two. Uh, I mean, some singular uh, surfaces. Yeah. Yeah. Is it not. Totoro? Yeah, Totoro. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's using this. It yeah, uh -huh. this, it's, it's exactly this, for this, uh, uh -huh. these things which. Uh, so you can do it in characteristic P. So the, the, but the thing is, you can, why P equals 2? Yeah. The reason is that you get better bounds for the N and the D. You can do it for any P, but if you take a bigger P, you don't, the, 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 the bound between N and D is not as good as the one you get for P equals 2. That's the only reason why you look at P equals 2. So but mm -hmm. yeah, the, the Z is singular. This, these are the ones he's, a, he's been using. Yeah? Uh -huh. I just, uh, there was a talk which I attended, yeah. not due to him, but due to another person. Uh, I don't remember his name. Yeah. Uh, and the person searched, uh, I mean, the talk was about uh, very special uh, surfaces in characteristic two. And then it's, it's, it's not surfaces here. It's not, it's not surfaces. It's not Maybe surfaces. it was not about surfaces. No. Okay. With some special dissimilarization. I, yeah. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, in this case, the, the whole decimulation work had been done by Collard 20 years ago uh, for, the, for this one. Uh,